Chapter 20, Flaming Eyes By George, if you ain't right, exclaimed Mudcat Joe, he's about done up too. With a hard pull at the right oar, he sent the boat directly towards the man who was struggling in the water. The victim's face had been submerged. Only a white hand fluttered weakly above the surface. Penny tore off her shoes and stood up in the boat, ready to dive aboard. Hold on, said Mudcat Joe calmly. I'll get him. Long as the man's struggling, he ain't drowned. The river man was now close enough to thrust an oar towards the victim, who seemed too spent to grasp it. The next moment, the boat pulled alongside, and Mudcat managed to grasp the man by an arm. I got him, he said grimly. Steady now, or you'll upset the boat. Mudcat Joe was a heavy man, an added weight of the limp figure very nearly capsized the craft, but Penny and Louise kept to the opposite side, trying to maintain balance. The boat wobbled and jerked convulsively. Finally, Mudcat Joe succeeded in pulling the relaxed figure over the gunwale. He stretched the man on the bottom of the boat, turning him so that his face was visible in the dim starlight. The girls took one glance and gave cries of dismay. Jerry! Penny exclaimed. A wave of mingled joy and terror swept over her. To have found the reporters seemed nothing short of a miracle, but his condition was deplorable. There was a deep gash across, across Jerry Livingston's forehead, and his breathing was light and fluttery. Your coat, Joe she commanded, covering from her first shock. We must keep him as warm as we can. The river man stripped off the garment, and Penny wrapped it about Jerry's own wet clothes. Then, kneeling beside the figure, she began to apply artificial respiration, timing her movements with the reporter's labored breathing. We must get him to a doctor, she said to Mudcat Joe. The river man nodded and bent the oars with energy. It was a hard battle against the current with the boat riding low in the water. Louise tried to help Penny, but there was very little she could do. What could have happened, she murmured. How do you suppose he came to be in the river? Penny did not answer, for she felt, that, for she felt Jerry stir. He gave a low moan and muttered something which she could not distinguish. But a moment later, the word was clear enough. Eyes, he murmured, flaming eyes, looking at me, looking at me. Why, he's out of his head, Louise whispered. Yes, I'm afraid he's in a bad condition, Penny said anxiously. That gash in his head looks deep. I hope it won't become infected from the dirty river water. At this particular point, there was no cabins or houses along the cobalt. Penny scanned the shore for a sign of light, and seeing nothing, decided that Jerry must be taken either to Old Mansion or to Joe's cottage. Facilities were much better at the former place, but intuition warned her that it might be wise to keep the news of Jerry's reappearance from Mr. and Mrs. Comstock as long as possible. What had occurred in Room 7 on that eventful night of the party Jerry alone knew the answer, but whether or not the secret would remain forever locked in his brain, she could not guess. The reporter had suggested a great shock, in addition to his experience in the water. What was evident ever to her untrained eye? Jerry's lips were moving again. Penny bent closer. Boat, he murmured. Boat. Yes, you're in a boat, Penny said soothingly rubbing his icy hands and trying to restore circulation. You're with friends, Jerry. The reporter's eyes fluttered open, but there was no recognition in his glance as he stared at Penny. Boat, he muttered again. Houseboat. The word startled Mudcat Joe and the two girls. They waited tensely, but with a tired sigh, Jerry's eyelids closed again. His head rolled restlessly back, and forth on the floor of the boat. He spoke no more. Why, your finger, he said that, asked the river man in low tones. I don't know, said Penny slowly. 
Her thoughts leapt back to the houseboat, which she and Louise had observed in the Snark River only an hour earlier. The boat had mysteriously vanished. A natural assumption was that it had taken to the main river once more. Was it possible that Jerry had been held prisoner aboard and somehow had managed to escape? Yet there had been no evidence of captives on the houseboat. The boat had two rooms, and Louise and I could see into one, and the other one was dark. Penny thought Jerry could have been held prisoner there, but it doesn't seem likely. Sing Lee appeared to be taking food to his friends. The possibility occurred to her that Jerry, while struggling in the water, battling to reach his shore, might have seen the houseboat leave the mouth of the Snark River. Perhaps he had attempted to signal the boat, and failing had believed that his only hope of rescue was gone. Such an experience would be like would likely to leave the houseboat imprinted indelibly upon his mind, and thus his strange muttering could be explained. But with this theory, there remained the disturbing question, why had Jerry been in the water at all? Where had he been held prisoner, and by whom? If Sing Lee did have anything to do with this, Gregory Kane might not wish him to learn that Jerry has been found, she reflected. Until I've talked with Dad, the best thing to do is to keep him undercover. She then asked Mudcat Joe if the reporter could be taken to the cottage and receive a hearty and received a hearty assent. Watching Jerry anxiously as the boat made its slow progress up the river, Penny hoped that she had made no mistake in her decision. When she reached the cottage, she would summon a doctor at once, and if necessary, the reporter could be removed to the hospital. A feller looks pretty well done in for me, observed Mudcat, as he pulled steadily on the oars. I fished plenty of em out of the river, but I've never seen one act like him before. I'm worried, Penny admitted soberly. After a trip which seemed endless, the boat at last scraped on sandy beach beside Mudcat Joe's cottage. Bring a lot, Jin, shouted the riverman. As the woman appeared in the doorway with a kerosene lamp, Mudcat Joe lifted Jerry from the boat and carried him into the cottage, the girls offering what assistance they could. Jenny, don't just stand there agaping, Mudcat said to his wife. Get some blankets and heated stones for her bed. Jenny knew exactly what to do, for during her many years on the water, this was not the first time she had been called upon to minister to the needs of a river victim. You get them wet clothes off of him, she told her husband. He can have Jed's bed. With no ceremony, the boy was routed out of his snug nest and stood watching drowsy-eyed as his father rolled the stranger beneath the covers. Jenny heated stones in the oven, which she wrapped in towels and placed at Jerry's feet. She robed the other, she robbed the other beds of blankets, observing they ain't nothing better than a ailing man to make him feel good as sweat. I'll go for a doctor, said Penny. She and Louise made a quick trip in their car to White Falls, summoning the village physician, Dr. Hornsley. They took him to the cottage and then returned to the village once more so that Penny could telephone her father. Jerry's been found, Mr. Parker asked, a break in his voice. That's the best news I've heard in a thousand years. He's in bad shape, Dad, Penny said. Dr. Hornsley is examining him now. I'm afraid of the verdict. You stay there until I can come, Penny. We'll have Jerry moved to Riverview Hospital and not spare the cost. Returning to Mudcat Joe's cottage, the girls arrived just as Dr. Hornsley was ready to leave. How is he, Doctor? Penny inquired anxiously. His condition is grave, replied Dr. Hornsley, peering at her though, or through his nose glasses. The man has suffered a great shock. But will he recover? He has a chance, unless pneumonia should develop. However, his mind, Dr. Hornsley completed his meaning 
by giving a little shake of his head. Oh, that would be dreadful, gasped Penny. Well, he may improve after a lengthy rest, the doctor said cheerfully. We will hope for the best. I wonder what happened to him. We don't know, doctor. He was struggling in the river when we found him. From the wound on his head, I assume he was struck by a hard blow with a blunt object. The skull is not fractured, at least unable to determine it without an x-ray. My father is coming from Riverview, Penny said. With your approval, he plans to take Jerry to the hospital at once. That would not be advisable, in my opinion. You will do the pertinent the patient more harm by moving him than allowing him to remain. But facilities are so limited here, doctor. Perhaps within 24 hours he may be transferred to the hospital, said Dr. Hornsley, but certainly not tonight. I shall try to locate a nurse. In the meantime, you will remain here. Yes, of course. I have explained to Mrs. Gates about the medicine. There is very little that can be done except to give the patient complete rest. Dr. Hornsley snapped shut his medical case, bowing politely as he bade Penny good evening. While Lois drove the physician back to White Falls, she remained at Jerry's bedside. The reporter's head had been neatly bandaged with white wrappings, accentuated the ashen color of his skin, it seemed to Penny almost as if she were gazing at a stranger. The man on the bed did not seem like Jerry Livingston. He was, he has just has to give well, she thought miserably. Jenny Gates displayed a surprising amount of common sense in caring for the patient. She closed off the door leading to the bedroom and herding her children into other chambers insisted that they create no disturbance. An unnatural silence fell upon the little cottage. Now and then Penny heard Mudcat Joe or his wife tiptoe across the kitchen floor, but they did not enter the room where Jerry lay. The only light came from the oil lamp on the dresser, which cast grotesque shadows on the plaster walls. At, fre at infrequent intervals Jerry stirred, muttering words which Penny could not understand. She began to wish that Louise would return from White Falls or that her father would arrive. She had never experienced anything so hard as to sit with hands folded watching Jerry, her heart leaping into her throat every time he made the slightest movement. Penny had never taken care of anyone who was ill. If only the nurse would come soon to take charge. Presently, she heard a sound outside the window. Someone was walking along the gravel path. It was probably Louise, she thought, although she had not heard the car drive up. Her father could not have had time to reach White Falls. Penny reached over to rearrange the blankets which Jerry's fluttering hands had disturbed. As she sat back again, listening for Louise to enter the house, she became conscious of the sensation of uneasiness. It was if she could feel unfriendly eyes staring into the room. Penny smiled ruefully, thinking that Jerry's mutterings had unnerved her. Then her glance wandered towards the window, and she stiffened in her chair. An ugly face was peering through the divided panes. Do, 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 do.